slice her feet to get you through the longer day. You can't make somebody love you. I promise to be there. So learn to love without demands and to live without a care. presenting today. He was a key figure in resurrecting us after a short hiatus at the start of the pandemic. He has served as our technical director, making us look good on Zoom every Sunday, as well as in person at the Friendly House for many years. This morning, David Danucci describes how deep learning differs from traditional computer programming and what society might expect from artificial intelligence in the near future. Dr. Danucci has been a researcher at NASA, as well as with his own company, Elipar. A warm welcome for our current president, Mr. David Danucci. I've got a hat on today. I think it's Pukulana Country Club uh, in honor of it being Easter. And it's kind of a tradition here at, at HGP to be wearing hats uh, on Easter, but I'll take it off for the rest of the talk. <laughs> so thank you very much. And there's uh, lots of people showing up today. That's great. I didn't know how Easter would go. Um, I was kind of um, prompted to give this talk in my own mind based on a talk we had recently. Um, uh, Laurent uh, Beauregard uh, talked to us about artificial intelligence and it was an excellent talk, very interesting. And I noticed that something that I had been learning about, uh, about computers uh, was uh, not mentioned. And it, it's such a big thing happening now. And so few people really understand it that I saw that there's a need for us to kind of fill in a gap in our understanding of what's going on with the newest kind of technology in AI. Um, so it's, it usually goes by the, uh, the term of deep learning or, artif or um, artificial neural networks. And um, I'm gonna try to give kind of a background for that so that you can at least understand what's going on. Now, I was tempted to, to make this talk just full of examples and, and things that would just be awesome and would knock your socks off. And I'm sorry, it's not gonna be that. Um, <laughs> it's gonna take so much time to kind of get the basic principles across that there aren't gonna be very many examples that I'm gonna show you. But what I'm gonna do is provide a list of links afterward, uh, not during this talk, but I'll email them out that will um, that you can go to and actually see all this stuff in action, but you're seeing it in action every day almost. So it, it seems that computing had been going along and we'd been hoping for all these great things out of computers for so long, and we'd been dreaming of what they could do, and we weren't really getting much of anywhere. We were trying very hard and not making a whole lot of progress, and then suddenly it seems like 10 or 15 years ago, 
suddenly our phones started talking to us and we got these speakers in the room that would listen to what we're saying. And, and you see along the bottom of your screen, maybe right now there's translation going on where the computer is actually, I mean, transcription where it's, it's understanding what I'm saying and, and putting it on the screen. All this stuff just seemed to just happen in, a, in an instant almost in computer time. And how did this all happen? And the reason is there's been a paradigm shift in, in computing. And that's what I'm hoping to kind of explain the basis of to you today. So what first, before I explain that what a paradigm, what, what happened, I have to make sure that you understand what computing has been like almost since the beginning of computing. And uh, it's very simple, actually. You already know. Um, if you're not familiar with programming or algorithms, you're at least familiar with recipes or plans or things like that. And basically it's um, all of those things are all in the same form. There's just a bunch of steps that you're trying to follow to provide, which given some kind of input produces a desired output. In the terms of a recipe, the inputs might be the ingredients and the recipe is the steps and the result is, you know, something that's, that's cooked in a, in any kind of a, plan, there will be some something that you're trying to produce as a result of what you've got on hand to start out with. But it's always expressed as some sort of steps that you're supposed to follow. Um, and they're usually precise enough to follow. You know which steps you can follow. It's you, they're usually in a sequential order unless they specifically say otherwise. So for example, in a recipe, it might say, uh, dollop the, the cookies onto the cookie sheet until the cookie sheet is full two, two, two inches apart or something. Well, that's an example of a, a repetition happening in the algorithm. Or, you know, if you don't have buttermilk, you can use milk and lemon juice or something mixed. So that's an alternative. So all these plans or recipes or programs, that's basically all they're made up of is a sequential, usually sequential steps with alternatives and repeating. And it's just very precise about what you're supposed to do based on the input to get the result that you want. And that's what computing has been like. So, so many years ago, people were asking, what does computing really mean? And Alan Turing in 1936 sat down and actually defined what he said it meant. And he came up with a formal definition which has since come to be known as a Turing machine. And basically it just formally embodies those principles that I just told you about. Um, but it also turns out, you know, when you say computing, aren't I computing something when I'm working out a formula on a piece of paper or something? Well, yes, I am. And as it turns out, um, any kind of mathematical calculation, um, is can also be considered computing. And in fact, now it's been formalized in something called the church Turing thesis that anything that you can express mathematically, you can also express as a series of steps, just like I was talking about with these conditionals and repetition or vice versa. Anything you can, you can describe as repetition and steps, you can describe as a mathematical uh, a formula. So, of course, it's it's the representation is very different, and the way you think about it is different. But anything you can do with one, you can do with the other, etc. So, um, so all those are just forms of computation that we've been as we've been considering it ever since computers came along. So, computers have been built to do that kind of computation, and usually there's a CPU inside that that fetches the, looks at each instruction, decides what the instruction is supposed to do. Based on the instruction, it might go to memory and uh, pull some data out and do some computation and put data back to memory, et cetera. I should mention that that's, th that's what we mean by computer these days. Back before we had electronic digital computers, we still had computers, but they were people. There used to be, 
people sitting in a room doing computations on paper and pencil. Usually they were women, by the way. Um, and those people were known as computers. And the basic principle was the same even back then. They, uh, the, the scratch pad was the memory. The, their, their head had some memory in it, but it was the CPU where it was doing the actual computation and following the instructions that, that needed to be followed to get the job done. But generally speaking, that's what computing has meant for the last 60 years, 70 years, 80 years almost uh, to us is just following these steps, et cetera. Now these days, CPUs can execute about a billion instructions per second uh, per thread, and they can often do multiple threads, and I'm not gonna explain threads. And these days we're trying to get that up to what we call exascale, which is a billion, billion instructions per second. Um, that's, we're just barely getting on the edge of that by tying together millions of computers together to, to form a, to do a single calculation. And some people have estimated that that's about the level that you need to simulate what's going on in the brain. But, but you might be surprised at that based on what the rest of this talk is gonna <laughs> describe. So, um, so that's, that's how fast CPUs are going these days, just to, just to compare with what we're gonna show in a minute. So then the question becomes, what is artificial intelligence? And I'm going to answer that hardly at all in this talk. Um, the same guy, Alan Turing, who came up with that uh, formal definition of computation back in 36, was also thinking about intelligence and thinking about, you know, if we have this form of computation, can we make something that seems intelligent? And so he made up a thing called the Turing test to decide whether something was intelligent, which just said, if you're communicating with this thing, let's say it's in a room, you don't know if it's a person, you don't know if it's a computer, you don't know what it is, and you're communicating with it over some sort of a, a, a screen or a teletype or something, and it can fool you into thinking that it's a human, whether it really is a human or not, then you have to consider it as intelligent. That's kind of called the Turing test. But if you ask me, that's a really unsatisfying answer. And it probably was satisfying a few years ago. But these days, I mean, for example, it equates all intelligence um, at every level. All humans are just as intelligent, according to this uh, definition. Um, and if it's doing much better than a human, then you know it wouldn't be considered intelligent because you could tell it wasn't a human. There's, there's all kinds of issues with this definition of intelligence. But let it be said that we have had computers around for a long time. We've wanted them to act more intelligently than we've gotten them to act. <laughs> and we have not had much luck. We've been banging our head against that wall trying to get this form of computation, which is just following a set of rules to seem like it's intelligent and we haven't been getting anywhere. Another thing that Laurent brought up in his talk was the Chinese room experiment, where if you're just feeding symbols into this room, let's say they're Chinese and the person in the room can't understand Chinese, but has some sort of a translation uh, rule to to whenever he gets this symbol, push this other symbol out the door. And someone looks at the symbols going in and out and says, oh, this person must understand Chinese because it all makes sense. Um, even if the person in the room doesn't understand Chinese, but they're following very precise rules out of a book, let's say. Um, and and is that really intelligence? Is, is that person in the room intelligent even though they have no idea what they're doing? Um, that's, that's kind of an issue. That's, that's kind of the way that computing has been trying to solve the problem is moving symbols around, uh, you know, doing computations just to kind of make it seem that, that, they're, that, they, that they're intelligent. But 
it's very hard to, to approach the question of artificial intelligence, um, but you're gonna see how that relates to uh, this topic uh, once we get into it today. So I'm not gonna try to define intelligence or claim anything is, or a computer is intelligent, but you can still think about questions like, is programming a computer teaching the computer to do something? If you're just telling it step for step what it should do when this thing happens, are you teaching it? Is it learning? It, that doesn't seem like learning to me. Um, you know, it's very different from a child learning. A child will go around, experiment with the real world, have these senses that it's determined, it sees around it what's going on and experiment and have teachers and maybe somebody will slap its hand if it's doing the wrong thing or praise it if it's doing the right thing. Um, you know, that's more like learning and teaching. And that's what we might use those terms to mean. But a computer doesn't have senses. It has very little interaction with the environment. You know, how is it gonna learn if it doesn't have interaction with the environment? And also, as far as the Turing test, having something in a room that seems like a human, is that equating a child's intelligence with Einstein's intelligence? As long as it seems like a human in the room, it's intelligent? I mean, so that's, those are all difficult questions. So then the question comes, okay, we've got these computers, they follow all these steps, is that anything like the human brain at all? And the answer is absolutely not. You are not gonna look in the human brain and find anything that looks like memory, that finds anything that looks like a CPU. There's not data moving around between a CPU and a memory. None of that kind of stuff is happening. We, uh, Alan Turing and other people just thought of computation in these terms of step-by-step -step and repetition and alternatives and things like that, because it's easy for humans to communicate those kinds of concepts to each other in, in that form. But that doesn't mean it has anything to do with what's going on in our head. So what's going on in our head? Well, that's what's going on in our head. <laughs> that is a bunch of neurons in a person's head. Um, I believe this picture was made by Golgi many, many years ago. He's one of the first guys who started imaging neurons. And it just looks like a mess of cells. And how the heck is that going to result in any sort of intelligence or computation or anything else? Well, the first thing you can do is break that down into individual neurons. And each neuron looks like this. Now there's all these labels here and that's just because this free picture that I got had all these labels, don't worry about them. The main thing that's, the, the main form that you have to worry about is the neuron has a cell body and I hope you can see my uh, cursor. I'm not sure if you can. Oh, good, you can. So there's the cell body also known as the soma. That's that big kind of nodular thing on the left. And that's surrounded by these little tendrils that come out, which are called dendrites or dendritic branches. And those can be considered as the inputs to this cell body. So, so impulses, nerve impulses will come in via these dendrites and this cell body will essentially get excited based on these impulses that are coming in. And if it gets excited enough, it will fire, so we'll use, I'll use that term fire, and send another impulse down this long thing that goes off to the right, that's called an axon. So there's basically these short little dendrites, which are the inputs, and then this long axon, which is like an output. And it'll send a nerve impulse out to this axon where this axon then connects to other neurons. So this little green thing on the right here, that's supposed to represent yet another cell body of another neuron. So these this axon is connecting to its dendrit, dendrites through things called synapses 
and I'm not going to get into all the details of how the synapse works or whatever, but that's the basic idea is you've got inputs coming in from the dendrites. If the cell body gets activated based on those inputs, it sends an output out onto the axon to other neurons. That's basically all there is to it. I mean, just from that kind of a very simple connection, we are somehow getting all this, you know, intelligence and computation and everything going on in our heads. So how could that happen? Well, people start looking into that. First, let me uh, give a few more little details of this. One is the connections of this axon to these other dendrites of other neurons, those are different strengths. That is, some of those attachments are, are extreme. It'll it may be attached to several dendrites of the same neuron, and therefore any kind of an impulse that goes through this axon is really going to affect this next neuron. Or maybe it's just very loosely connected to this next neuron. Maybe there's just one little, one little uh, synaptic uh, connection to this next neuron, and then this impulse that goes through this axon is barely going to affect the next neuron. It's also possible to make connections that make the next neuron not want to fire. That is, some of these axons that connect can actually uh, inhibit the next neuron from firing. So if you've got one neuron coming in that's one axon coming in that's inhibiting it, and lots of other ones that are that are exciting it, then the inhibitory one will actually kind of pull away from the ones that are trying to excite it and they'll fight against each other. Um, so, so, and that's really all there is to it. Well, the, one, more, one more point. If, if, an, if one of these nerve cells gets very activated, it will repeatedly be sending impulse after impulse after impulse very quickly down this axon. Otherwise, it might just send once every once, one every once in a while. So, so each neuron is going to get ex more excited if it's getting lots and lots of inputs than if it's just getting one every once in a while. Now, how long does all this take, by the way? It takes about a millisecond. That is a thousandth of a second for all these inputs to come in and this thing to fire and to send the thing down the, the line to the next neuron. In computer time, that's ridiculously slow. That's how fast computers were decades ago. These days, a computer can do about a million instructions in the time that a single neuron takes to figure out whether it should be sending the impulse down to the next neuron. So these neurons are really slow. And yet, us humans, we can recognize a face in about a tenth of a second. and that's about enough time for a hundred of these neurons to fire. So there's only a, a path of about a hundred neurons from the time that the signal comes in from your eye to the decision time when you, are dis when you recognize a face. And you know, obviously a hundred of these things all by itself isn't going to do that job. There's a lot of work uh, happening for you to recognize a face. And that's because there's lots and lots of these all happening at the same time. They are just cascading. There's, there's thousands or maybe millions of neurons all firing at the same time and all working in parallel to recognize that face. So some people looked at this brain and it turns out that it was at the same time that all this other computing stuff was going on, people were looking at the brain as well and saying, maybe that's how computing should work. So I'm guessing that you can't see all the details on this timeline, but I'll kind of point some out. Um, way here on the left where I'm pointing, that's a 1943. Um, some people looked at the brain and they said, and they recognized how these neurons fit together. And McCulloch and Pitt wrote some papers about how this all worked. And they said, maybe we can make computation work this way. Remember, there were no computers back here. This was just after Alan Turing had even 
written down what he thought computation looked like. So, and in by, you know, 1950, early 50s, um, you know, we were starting to get electronic digital computers. And so we were getting somewhere through Alan Turing's approach of these following these steps and all that kind of stuff. And still, people were still looking at the brain saying, well, maybe, you know, there's another alternative way to go about this. So in 58, a guy named Rosenblatt wrote a paper on perceptrons. And, and here he came up with a much better model of how these neurons worked than the original paper of McCulloch and Pitt. And boy, people were starting to get excited about this. They thought, you know, maybe at this point we'll be able to do automatic translation of languages, we'll be able to recognize people speaking. They had high expectations. That was in 1958. And we realized that parallel to this, the whole computer revolution is still stepping along. We have electronic digital computers are getting faster, they're getting uh, smaller. And then in 1969 or so, two AI researchers named Minsky and Papert, who became very well known and famous, they wrote a book on these neural nets with these neurons, these artificial neurons that Rosenblatt had written about in 58. Only in their paper, they said, they, they can't really do anything, they're useless. And they, he even, they even put some proofs that you can't really do much with these neurons. Um, so they wrote this in 69 and it basically killed off the entire approach. People just said, ah, dead end, let's forget about it. We've got all these computers going like crazy um, and they're getting smaller and faster all the time. Let's just put our efforts there. So, you know, by, by the early 70s, we had microprocessors coming out and we were going, I mean, computers were taking off and, and revolutionizing the world. But there were still some researchers kind of still looking at this field of perceptrons, artificial neural networks, artificial neurons, and seeing what they could do about it. And there are names like Hopfield, uh, Jeff Hinton, Terry Sainowski, uh, John Rommelhart, et cetera, that were all looking at, they, they still thought there was a lot of promise there and that this book by Minsky and Papert was really kind of overstating the condition of how, how useless these things were. So that brings, that's where I came into the story. So I've been in computing ever since 72 when uh, in high school, when I started doing computing and I had never heard of this other approach even being considered until about 1988 or 89 in grad school, as I was getting my PhD, I took this class at Oregon Graduate Institute from Dan Hammerstrom. And it seemed like just kind of a pet project that he said, oh, there's these people over at Stanford Rummel Hart and uh, Sanowski and Hinton that are working on this thing that they call artificial neural nets. And so I took the course and it was interesting. It seemed really interesting. And that's what I'm gonna to explain to you today. And, but even after I took the course, nothing seemed to happen. And so I thought it was still a dead end. It was just a fun little thing to know until about 10 or 15 years ago and then suddenly this stuff started taking off like crazy. So that's what I'm going to get into here. So what did, what did you know, these uh, neural net researchers do? Well, what they did is they created artificial neural nets, which they took the very basic concepts of what's going on in the brain, and they tried to simulate them in, in a traditional computer. So you know, why are we simulating these in traditional computers? Because when you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We've got computers, you know, they were going crazy. Let's just simulate this other approach in our computers that we have rather than try to build a whole new industry to try to build it the way the brain builds it. So we'll just simulate it. Okay, how do we simulate it? This picture here, 
kind of shows how we think of neural nets and they're in layers. So each of these, each of these circles represents an artificial neuron. And as you can see, there's a layer on the left, which we would call the input layer. There's a layer in the middle, which is often called the hidden layer. There's a layer on the right, which is called the output layer. And there can be many hidden layers. And in fact, that's where the term deep learning comes in is often deep learning is about having many layers in the middle. But even with just one layer in the middle, you can start seeing what the promise of this approach is. So the idea is that each of these lines between the neurons in the layers represents a connection, very much like those axons and dendrites. And each of these lines has associated with it a little, a number between minus one and one that represents how strong the connection is between the neuron you know, on the left and the neuron on the right. Um, if it's a one, that means that's a really strong connection. If it's a minus one, it means that whenever the neuron on the left is firing, that really tries to keep the neuron on the right from firing. And if it's zero, it means there's no connection between them at all. So every one of those lines represents that connection strength or what we'll refer to as a weight. The input layer on the left represents sort of where the nerves, where the nerve impulses are coming into the brain. You can think of this as, an, if you want to think of this as an artificial brain. And that would be like from the retina on the eye or from your fingertips or from your ears or whatever. In this example, we'll use something about vision. Because this is in a computer and a computer doesn't have a retina, it doesn't have an eye, but what we do have in computers a lot is data, <laughs> things like pictures. So what the ver a very common use of these neural nets is to take a picture like this image of a dog on the left and you break it up into little pieces which are called like pixels. And you take, for example, the top little, the top left corner piece and you say, is that dark or light? And if it's, if it's dark, I mean, if it's light, you put like a one on this first neuron. And if it's dark, you put a zero. And then you take the next pixel and you just break this whole image up into little tiny zeros and ones. And you feed those zeros and ones in on this input layer. So you've taken this picture, this perfectly good picture of a dog, and you've broken it up into something that's just useless, a bunch of little individual dots, the individual ones and zeros. And you feed it in on this input layer. And then here's what happens. Here's the way each one of these neurons works. I told you that each one of these lines has a weight that's represented. What happens is each neuron takes the inputs, and for each input, it multiplies it by the weight on that link to, to, to adjust it by how strong the connection is. And it adds together all the impulses it's getting from all those inputs. And then it determines whether the result, once it's added them all together, is over some threshold, which we call B. So each neuron might have a different threshold. And if it's over the threshold, it basically sends out a new impulse on the, on the result. And that impulse may be a one or a zero or a minus one. It may send a negative impulse out. You, you put the picture of the dog here on the left, all the individual uh, pixels, that results in some, some kind of activation here in the middle. Each one of these neurons is gonna, send, is gonna come out to be some result between zero and one based on these inputs. And then that goes through another step and comes out on this other end. Great. So you've totally messed up all of these input bits into some output bits. What have you got? Well, if, if you start out with random weights, obviously you're not gonna end up with much on the output. But here's, the, here's where the learning comes in. Each one of these output neurons, you think of one of them might represent dog and one might represent cat and one might represent broom or something like that. And the objective of this network is to recognize these different objects coming in and to light up the proper neuron in the output. So we would like this dog to light up one 
neuron on the output that's called dog. And that's not going to happen the first time we feed the dog in. It's going to light up random neurons on the output. And so we have to go and train the network. We have to tell it, no, no, no. We wanted you to light up the one that said dog on it. And the way you do, the way we do that is, is a technique called uh, back propagation. We say, here's what we wanted the output to be for that input. And we will go through and adjust slightly the weights on all of these, on all these connections so that the next time we feed that same picture through, it'll have a much higher chance of getting the right output. And we do that for many, many, many different pictures of dogs. We feed each dog in, it comes up with some answer. And if it's close to the right answer, we say, great. And if it's the wrong answer, we go through and we adjust the weights so that the next time through, it's more likely to give the right answer. And we feed lots of pictures of cats and lots of pictures of brooms, et cetera, through this thing. And all we do is we adjust the weights on those connections. And amazingly, we can, using this approach, actually train this network so that when we feed pictures of dogs in, it's going to light up the right output neuron for dog. And when we feed cats in, it's going to feed uh, light up the right network for cats, et cetera. Now, this, what we, it's, it takes a long time to learn. That is, we have to feed in the same set of pictures of dogs like many, many, many times before and, and do these weight adjustments and stuff before we ever get to the point where it's actually going to end up lighting up the right, pick, the right uh, neurons on the output. But, once we do that, then we can start. So, so we start with a training data set. We train it on the training data set. In the training data set, we know what the right answer is. We know that that's a dog and we know which neuron on the output should be lit up for dog. We train it based on that data set. And then once we're done with that, we go to new pictures that it's never seen before and we feed them in. And we say, what do you think this is? And it, it gets to be correct. It gets pretty close. It, it uh, can guess dogs versus brooms, for example, uh, more than, definitely more than just random. So the question is, how do we make it better and better? And, but also, what are the implications of this whole ability to recognize things coming in through this very, very simple process. Okay, so that's basically what artificial neural nets is about. And the rest of this talk will be kind of uh, refining that idea. The general implications, first of all, to train one of these networks like, oh, well, let me say one more thing about the network. The number of input neurons is, is based on, you know, whatever your input senses are, but the number of hidden layer neurons is usually much smaller than the number of inputs. What's happening is it's generalizing. These middle neurons end up kind of representing higher level features that are present in the input. So one of these might get, end up getting activated if it sees something that looks like a nose in the picture. Whenever there's a nose in the picture, maybe this neuron will, this first one will be lighting up. Whenever it sees, you know, the proper colors in the picture, maybe this middle neuron will get lit up. And so, so automatically this thing is learning about generalizing about the inputs. And we're not doing anything. We're just feeding the inputs and telling it what the right output is. And it's kind of coming up with these generalizations automatically in, in this network, almost certainly happening in our brain. So some general implications of this. To make it work, you need a lot of data. And to train it, you need to know what the right answer for each one of these input data things are. So you know, if you have lots of pictures, you have to know what's in the picture. 
in order to train this thing that this picture is supposed to say dog at the end and this picture is supposed to say cat at the end, et cetera. So where do you come up with all those pictures with labels on them of the right answer? So you gotta, you gotta have a lot of data to start out with. So what I just described was called supervised learning and that's where you're actually telling it explicitly, this was the right answer to that input and, and I want you to get that right answer in the future. There are some other ways that you can learn. For example, if you're playing a game, you can kind of tell at the end whether you got the right answer or not by whether or not you win the game. So there are other ways of learning that you don't have to supervise every step. You don't have to tell it whether it got the right answer or not. You can just assume that you got the right answer if you got a good result. Think about your behavior. Um, there are places online, let's say places like Facebook and Google that are constantly measuring what your responses are to various kinds of stimulus. Um, when something comes up on the screen, are you gonna click on it? Or are you not gonna click on it? And they have records of all this stuff. So the inputs are what's on your screen. The outputs are your behavior. Can it predict what your behavior is gonna be based on what's on the screen? And they are collecting this data like crazy. You are, they are collecting data about you and about humans in general and how we behave. And they are using these neural nets to try to make models of us and how we behave because that's very valuable to them. And there are some other ways of making these things learn. You can even make the output layer try to reproduce the input layer by first putting it through that hidden layer, which generalizes things and then change from the generalization back to an output. And that's just a way of trying to extract features from the input. Now, these things aren't quite like the brain. Um, they, well, there's a lot of ways they're not like the brain, but one way they're not like the brain is that you're in either in a training mode or a usage mode. That is this first mode where it's giving you the training data set and you're telling it which, whether it got the right answer or wrong answer, that's training. And then once the training is over and you're giving it novel data that it's never seen before, it's not learning anymore. It's just basing everything based on the learning that happened the first time. Not like us humans, we're always learning from our mistakes, learning from uh, new information, et cetera. But it's kind of hard to integrate that new information into these neural nets in that way. So, you know, there's still lots of things we do not understand about the brain, but this is just like a little glimpse of maybe some of the stuff, uh, the way the brain might work and that's useful to us. There are some neural nets, apparently they're, they are developing some that, that can learn some and, and I don't know enough about the differences to get into some of that stuff. So one of the issues here is we're using these now for all kinds of important things. For example, driving cars. Um, when uh, you've probably heard of cars that can almost drive themselves now and it won't be long before cars and trucks will drive themselves. They are looking around, they are recognizing things on the road up ahead through this very technology that we're talking about, augmented with some other technologies. I, I showed you how we train it on a known data set and then we give it novel data. And I said, a lot of times it gets the right answer. What if it gets the wrong answer? Whose fault is it that it got the wrong answer? Why did it get the wrong answer? This is all like a big black box. Once we've trained it, it's just a bunch of numbers that are doing this general kind of a calculation. And if, it, if there's a person up ahead of the car and it just didn't happen to recognize this person because it was, it was sufficiently different from what it seen before that it got confused, who's to blame? Is it the company that made this uh, neural net? They didn't train it enough. 
uh, is it the technology itself just isn't up to the task? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions about, uh, about this technology, but it's so useful, you can't just throw it out. So how, how have we made our huge advancements over the last 10 or 15 years in this field and why have they come now? Well, one is some people have decided we're gonna put a challenge out there. We're gonna to try to speed this along. And so the ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge, they found a million pictures with different things in them. And they said, we are going to figure out what's, what the proper answer for these pictures are so people can use them to teach their neural networks. So they went out and they hired you know, thousands of people to label each picture with what that person saw in the picture so that people could now use their neural networks. They could use these pictures to train their neural networks. And then they put a challenge. They said, okay, we, you can put 50, 50 million or 5 million of these pictures through your neural network to train it. And then we're gonna give you another million and we're gonna find out how you do on those, how, how good your answers are. And in 2010, you know, people, their neural networks were guess, were figuring out maybe 10 or 15% of the pictures, the untrained pictures, they were figuring out what was in the pictures. Um, and by the way, there were 10,000 object categories. So the, there were 10,000 different kinds of objects in the pictures that these neural nets had to differentiate between. By 2017, those numbers were like in the 70 and 80 percentage. That is, they, 70 or 80 percent of the time, these neural nets were able to tell what was in the picture uh, based on the training that it had had with other pictures. So there had been a lot of advancement happening between 2010 and 2017, and this kind of challenge was kind of spurring people to make those advancements. 2012 was, a special, was an especially a productive year apparently, and there are some articles that I'll provide links to that kind of say all the kind of things that people were doing in that year. Some of the technologies that people were have put in, there's recurrent neural nets. And in those cases, it's like you have a sequence of things and it's guessing the next thing in the sequence based on the same kind of technology. And you guys have seen this in action when you're typing along on your phone or something and it's guessing what the next word in your text message is gonna be. That's this kind of technology at work. It's taking all the stuff you've typed so far and based on that and based on every, everybody else's responses, it's guessing what the next word is gonna be in your, in your sentence. Convolutional neural nets are where it, it's the same basic technology I just showed you, only it's kind of scanning over a larger picture. So. Is there a puppy in this larger picture? Well, you can train a neural net to recognize puppies, and then you can look at little pieces of the larger picture and see and see if it recognizes a puppy anywhere in, in those littler pieces. Um, and that's kind of like the way our eyes work. Our eyes are dancing around. We're not just engaging everything in our field of view and, and instantly recognizing everything. We kind of focusing on the different pieces. And then there's generative adversarial networks or GANs. And the place you've heard of these maybe lately is something called deep fakes. Now deep fakes are scary. <laughs> deep fakes are where you can actually take say a video of one person doing something and put another person's face on the first person and maybe another person's voice into this other person and remake the entire video as though another person is doing it all or saying it all. And the way this works using the neural nets is the first neural net uh, determines where the face is, for example, it recognizes where the face is of the one person and videos of the face on the second person and it can replace the face of the first person onto the second person. And then you've got a second neural net that's looking at the result and saying, 
whether or not it looks realistic. It's saying, no, that doesn't really look like a person uh, because like the person's face color is different from his neck color or something. Um, so the second neural net will point out errors in the first one. And then the first one will say, okay, fine, I'll fix that. And it goes and it, it fine tunes the first, the, uh, the picture until the second one says, okay, that's a little bit better, but I now see this problem. It goes back and forth until the second one cannot tell that it's not a realistic picture. And at that point, the output pops out. And even you as a human often cannot tell that you're not looking at that real second person saying and doing the things that the first person was doing. This can be scary. This can be scary for politics. This can be, uh, I, apparently one place it's used is in porn. They'll take some pretty girl's picture, you know, maybe a teenager that they find on the internet somewhere and they'll take a porn star and, inter and put the pretty girl's picture onto the porn star. Um, this can be very upsetting and it's, uh, it's a problem, but it's something we have to at least know is happening in order to be aware of uh, you know, our environment and be ready for this stuff. Um, okay. Why is this taken off so fast? I showed you some of the new technologies, but also we're now just awash in data. Facebook, Google, these places, they are just collecting data like crazy. We've got electronic medical records where we've got medical data coming in like crazy and being stored everywhere. The computer cycles are becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. CPU cycles are everywhere. You don't have to rent out a supercomputer anymore. You can get on, there's all these services where you can basically use people's computers for free. Just, just amazing amounts of, of compute cycles. To build one of these neural net programs right now, uh, they've, they've got tool sets called like, things like PyTorch and TensorFlow. And you can write a neural net program in like five lines. You just say, oh, I want an input layer that has this many cells. I want a hidden layer that has this many. I have an output layer that has this many. My data is gonna come from here to feed the input layer. The answers are gonna come from there and go. And it's, uh, so it's easy for, for people to be experimenting with this technology. And there's definitely money to be made here. Whether we're talking about Facebook and Google, et cetera, figuring out whether a person's gonna click on an ad or what kind of ad's gonna appeal to them, that's money. Whether you're talking about automating things. So for example, when I took that class in 88, the tech, the tech, the uh, applications we were looking at, maybe we can recognize the zip codes on envelopes so that a person doesn't have to manually look at each envelope as the in the mail and route that that mail individually. That's the level we were at. Of course, computers can now read zip codes. They can read addresses. They're doing all this routing in the mail people are not doing that routing anymore. That means people are not in those jobs. Where are these things being used? Another application we were looking at in 88 was being able to recognize people speaking digits over the phone so that they can say the credit card number, et cetera. Of course, we're way past that. Now, these things are used everywhere. ATMs, you wouldn't be able to be, uh, depositing checks in your ATM if this thing wasn't recognizing, you know, the check amount, et cetera, on your checks. Mail routing, uh, as far as vision, self-driving cars, facial recognition. I don't know if you've been on, on Facebook where it said, can I, can I tag this photo as being your friend so-and-so? Because it's recognizing your friend's face in your photo already. I mean, it's using this technology. Uh, it can be used for surveillance. Apparently in China, it's used a lot for surveillance. There's cameras all over. It can recognize who's, who's, who is where, and maybe that's happening here too, who knows. Robots can recognize what's in their vicinity so they can deal with them. Voice recognition, we've got digital assistants everywhere. I mean, 
if I say to my phone, uh, hey Siri, what is deep learning? So, so learning it's going to respond to me. And that's all because it can recognize my voice and then and, and do what it needs to do. So, and the transcription happening on the bottom of the screen right now, as far as medicine, um, these things can analyze x-rays and determine whether or not there's something wrong in that picture better than humans can in some cases. So, um, so those are more people moving out of jobs, but it's also, you know, an advantage for humanity to have this service that we can, we can just feed an x-ray into this machine and it can tell us whether it sees cancer there or not. There's also other kind of diagnosis, medical diagnosis, et cetera. And, you know, when you're on Netflix and it's guessing, you know, maybe you'd be interested in this other movie or, or whatever, that's what's happening. It's, it's using these kinds of technologies to predict uh, what your behavior will be. So there's also more far out things. Um, and I will provide links to some of this where you can just say, I want a web page that looks like this. And it will write a program to, to, to set up a web page for you. Um, it can do poetry that's, that's very similar to human poetry. I told you about deep fakes. They've got a thing where it, um, you can debate against a human on a certain topic. It will basically search the internet on that topic and then come up with reasons that, it, that support its argument um, in a debate. Uh, I suppose you saw in Jeopardy, um, uh, IBM's Watson uh, beat the best Jeopardy player. Almost all the world's board games right now are being, uh, are the best players are computers based on this kind of technology. So have we built a brain out of this stuff? No, we haven't. We just found a little bit of technology that was similar to what happens in a brain and kind of exploited it. A brain uses about 12 watts of power. A computer that runs one of these neural nets can use kilowatts or megawatts of power. Um, these, the brain, each one of these neurons takes a, you know, a millisecond to fire. And these computers are running a million times faster and yet they aren't able to do half of what our brain is doing. So no, we have not created a brain. Uh, our use of computers to run these neural networks are in a sense very clumsy, but they're getting us somewhere. So what are the societal downsides? Well, anytime we come up with more automation, there's always arguments that, oh dear, what are computers, what are people gonna do now that all this stuff is automated? And somehow we've always made it through in the past and maybe we'll make it through in the future as well. Um, deep learning will always favor those with data. And they're, you know, Google and Facebook and those people just have tons of data and people doing medical records. There are certain companies that have all the data. Also automation favors capital over labor all the time. And so the people with the money, the people with the technology are going to have an advantage over those who are just grunt workers. And even those who are doing programming because now these are, it doesn't even require programming. You're just training these things on the data. You just write a simple little program and then you train it. Um, of course, it's not quite that simple but it's, getting, it's going in that direction. So this is basically an argument for and more of a division happening bef between the haves and the have nots. But it's also an amazing technology that's becoming available to us. And if you're a determinist who thinks that we have no free will, what you can see here is that these things are more and more predicting how we are gonna behave, maybe even before we know how we're gonna behave. That is, if it's putting all the same inputs into this neural net, that we're putting into it, then it knows what our result is gonna be, what our behavior is gonna be based on that. So it's, you know, it can be very scary, it can be very useful, but there's a lot of discussion to be had about where this is all gonna go.
So I could have made a whole hour of examples and it would have been fun. And maybe we should have another program where I can show you examples like this. But the main thing I wanted to do in this program is get an idea across about what's happening, why it's exciting, why it's scary. And um, then we can kind of look at examples in that context. And so I'll try to provide some uh, email that, that provides some of those links, et cetera. So that's uh, the end of my program. Thank you so much, Dave. That was an excellent history lesson and you really uh, broke this technology down well for us and gave us a lot of things to think about. Uh, we, we have a question from Lauren, but I will ask the first question. Uh, and I find this to be an interesting time and an interesting topic because I would argue that as computers are getting smarter and more able to recognize reality, human beings in our information ecosystem are getting less able to recognize reality. So how are these things going to interact in terms of uh, which reality computers get to see? Well, um, you know, there's an old computer saying that says, uh, it's an, that's abbreviated GIGO, which is garbage in, garbage out. Um, a computer can only process the information as input that you give it and it, and I should say, people also work in the, the same way. Um, I often wonder in this in this society we're in right now. You know, we can we can say those people are crazy. Those people are just behaving in a crazy way. But I kind of think those people are behaving the same way I would behave if I was getting the same information they were getting. It all has to do with trying to make sure that you get representative information that you can actually come up with good results. So um, it's absolutely true that, that we, at least for now, we are in control of what kinds of information is gonna be fed into these neural networks and, and what we get out of it. And as humanists, we have kind of a theory that the closer we are to, to representing all the reality around us, the happier we're gonna be, the more, the more we're gonna be able to work with the real world. And so, uh, yes, we've got to somehow, we, we think we will benefit by, by using very representative input information, but there will be other people that will try to use this to skew things, I'm sure. I don't know much what else to say other than that. So maybe our computers, our robots will say uh, programmed by MSNBC or programmed by Newsmax and we can make our choice. <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> our next question is from Lawrence. Uh, I was just saying that uh, I thought that this was a really, really good presentation. I want to flash back to the beginning where you were talking about the way the brain works and um, these exchanges of neurons and all of that kind of thing, that is in the background of everything that you presented after that. So that's very interesting. Thing I wanted to point to is that in your dog example, um, that has to do with perception. And I think that much of what you are saying today had to do with the sense of learning, deep learning as it pertains to the realm of perception. The brain is involved in perception. Okay, that's one thing. Now suppose that we're looking at conception, like forming concepts. It doesn't have to do with perceiving things like dogs. It has to do with thinking up things like what Isaac Newton was thinking up when he invented calculus. It has to do with what um, Darwin was uh, thinking up when he, the idea of evolution occurred to him. It has to do with what Einstein was thinking when he went through all of his thought experiments. All of that kind of thing obviously depends upon brain activity. All of that kind of thing must depend upon those neuron exchanges. So I guess to lead to the question, um, can you even in principle think of how the brain processes involved in forming concepts and in that kind of deep learning 
could possibly be uh, related to how computers work. I guess that's it. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I'll I'll give it a shot. I'll give I'll tell you the way I think about it. Um, if you think about that hidden layer in the neural network, which is has fewer neurons than the input layer. Um, there's generalization going on there. That is somehow this neural network needs to take all that input that it's getting and different inputs and somehow make it so that no matter what input it gets, it can filter down that information it's getting, that input into some, into this hidden layer, which you can think of as more general concepts or more general uh, features or, or whatever. So there's, there's some abstraction going on there in some sense in the neural net. And, and that's kind of the way that I see this conceptual thing happening is, you know, when, when Newton, you know, sees the planets going around the, the sun and sees the apple falling off of the tree and has all these other examples and he's he's coming up with this abstraction that, well, gee, in all these cases, you could explain this as things being pulled toward each other. Um, so there's, um, of course, you know, this is, <laughs> this is going to extremes and, and far beyond what these neural networks are really explaining, but that's kind, I still think of it as this abstraction of concepts from Lots of input, trying to trying to uh, sift it down into more basic uh, concepts or principles by which we can explain what we're what we're sensing. Okay, so um, just a little uh, add on to this. I think you did mention uh, free will, like uh, you know, and nothing that you uh, were depicting on how the brain works. Um, I can't see for the life of me how free will could have any role there at all on the one hand. On the other hand, when you get people like Newton and Einstein thinking up things that no one has ever thought before, you really kind of think that free will's going on there. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I won't make any comment on that. I, I, I personally think that, you know, that could probably be explained by just them having the kind of neurons and connections and, and plasticity, et cetera, that allows for more generalization and or computation to happen there, but. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, my question is sort of continuation of what uh, Lauren talked about. Uh, I understand that these days, uh, for example, uh, there are uh, computers can do mathematics. They can prove theorems. And I understand they, they can even make conjectures, which used to be the domain of mathematicians. But it turns out that not all of them are really good. Some of them are probably patently false, or the conjectures are sometimes silly and things like that. Now, the question arises like he talked about Newton, Einstein, and so on. See, even with normal uh, geniuses, what happens is there are moments of creativity, you know, people thinking about suddenly they have a realization, some sort of creative moment in which the solution just occurs to them, then, then they can solve that problem. Now, are there parallels of that type of thing can happen in, in this artificial intelligent computing? And like, for example, Heisenberg, he was walking then suddenly you have been thinking about it then the matrix mechanics and uncertainty principle all sort of came together and then within a few hours you could solve the whole problem. There are such moments, there are the equivalents of that thing in artificial intelligence. So that's so a good question. Um, and as far as creativity and how that how that is exploited or, or is represented in all of this. Um, I mentioned that there that some of these robots are now doing poetry and things like that. So people are trying to introduce creativity into what they're doing. And 
in fact, one of the one one really interesting thing that happens, you know that humans, for example, we recognize faces in things that don't really have faces. I think there's a name for it, like pareidolia or something like that, um, where where we see faces and everything just because our our brains are programmed to recognize faces so much that we recognize them even where they're not. And you can actually take these neural nets who, which are programmed to recognize faces and you can, you can give it random data and say, recognize faces here. And it will find faces in all of these weird places in this random picture. And then you can tell it, okay, then represent the faces and you can get really bizarre artwork with all these faces all over inside of an image that had no faces in it initially. Um, uh, there are, there are uh, neural networks where they put random data in and just don't put it, it will go in random directions. But even the whole idea of this learning algorithm that I didn't explain, a back propagation, it's all based on concepts like simulated annealing and um, where there's a lot of randomization going on. That is, uh, it, if you look into the technology, it's all about, you can imagine a, a surface with lots of dips and, and, and mountains, and some of the dips are lower than others. And how do you find the lowest dip? I mean, if you put marbles in the, in the surface, you kind of have to jiggle it around and have the marble bouncing around and you jiggle it too much and it bounces out of the low parts into the higher parts. But there's all of this kind of finesse to getting into these lowest uh, energy states. And that's all used in this learning algorithm that I mentioned. And so there's all of this random, random stuff going on. So it's very hard to say exactly you know where creativity comes from why some people are more creative than others etc but it's uh it's kind of it, it's all in this work and it's definitely something that's going to be explored more i'm sure no, a parallel question is uh without data or any data training for example if a given a problem can a computer start writing the programs and solve the problem okay. uh, I'm not sure I understood. Is, just give a problem, and then the computer should write a program and try to solve it. Yeah, uh, so no data is given to that. Right. So, so there is actually so the thing that I mentioned that will design web pages for you and stuff like that. Um, it it actually is quite amazing. Um, I forgot the exact number. It's like C3F or something, maybe. Uh, Maybe Laurent remembers what it was, but um, and I'll provide some links. But there are some amazing things that can be done along those lines, where mm -hmm. you can just basically describe what kind of uh, program you want, or picture, or whatever, and it can come and and produce something or okay. poetry. Hey, I have another question. So I'll put it in in the self-driving car example. It seems like over the course of human history. There's a certain percentage of humans that they enjoy sabotaging technology or confusing technology. And so let's say that uh, you got this self-driving car and then a homemade Portland recumbent bicycle comes on the road that it's never seen and, and there's an accident. So it seems like in this technology, we're gonna need an ecosystem for anticipating new objects uh, almost before they before they exist or before they come widespread. So, what's the ecosystem going to look like to assimilate new information? Well, um, there's a few parts to that. One is, as I mentioned before, these things are pretty good at generalizing uh, to to. Uh, operate on information they have not seen before, as long as it fits certain patterns of information that it has seen before. Um, so, so some of that is built into the system. Another part of that, um, these, these new cars, the Teslas, for example, um, these things are upgraded, the software is upgraded 
constantly. I mean, if you wake up in the morning and get in your car, it can be almost like a different car than, than you went to sleep the previous night with. Um, because overnight they will have upgraded the software to be more efficient on mileage, et cetera. And the same thing I'm sure will happen on all the recognition systems that are happening for the self-driving, et cetera. So, um, so, so some of it will happen manually. Some of it is in the system itself, but you're right. I mean, there will always be stuff that it doesn't recognize. And, and it's the same with us. I mean, we'll see something that we've never seen before. And, you know, where, where do we go from there? Uh, we have to determine, you know, how we're gonna integrate that into the model that's already in our head. And, and if it's gonna require any special, special rules to deal with it. And I'm sure the same thing will happen here. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Dave, your, your, your example of the, of the Chinese room uh, brought to my mind the concept that the computer would never figure out that people needed to have a language to begin with. So uh, there, there's obviously something that, that, that the machines are not doing. They're, you know, they're, not, they're not projecting or, or imagining the, the future. They're, they're fulfilling, um, they're aiming at specific goals. So the, in terms of values, um, they may have some values put into them, but they're not, they're probably not going to be able to adapt those values very well to, to the, to update them based on maybe getting bad results or things. Uh, there, there's just so many things that these computers can't do. Like they, you can say they can play Go, but they can't play Mario Brothers because they can't recognize objects lying around on the screen and what they can pick up, that they can pick up the objects and what they can do with them. But all these shortcomings, uh, thank goodness those shortcomings are in there because these things are going to just go ever loving crazy. If we fix the things that you, you've listed as problems, they're going to be, these machines are going to be so much worse. Um, the very next thing beyond, you know, optimizing advertising that these things will do is they'll go into setting the pricing algorithms. So what are you going to do when by the pricing algorithms, um, two, two uh, algorithms in different, or two, two brains in different companies, two electronic brains in different companies figure out how to signal each other and how to violate every third piece of the of the Sherman Act, <laughs> they did figure out how to how to uh, start the you know, run protection rackets. Every every crime in the world, they will evolve a way to do unless you find some way to keep them from doing it. But it's all in the middle layer, and you don't even know what's going on in there. <laughs> These things are going to be just ever love and terrible. So one of the main things you brought up is, you know, what are the motivations and the drive and whatever of these things? Right now, there, there isn't much motivation. We are providing the motivation. We are just training these things, as you said, to take input data and recognize certain, you know, things as output data. There's people worried about, you know, where AI is going to take over. AI is going to, you know, if, if AI can get smart enough to invent new AI that works better than the old AI, then our, us humans are just gonna be left behind because you know, there's, there's, the technology is gonna run away from us and, and there's no way we can keep up with it. And the only thing about that is motivation. That is, what is its motivation to do that? Right now, we're in control. We're having it to, we're telling it what to learn and why to learn it. Um, and, um, and if there is a motivation built in, then, you know, I, I always flash back to Colossus, the Forbin project and some of those old movies where the, where the computers take over everything. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, but, but at a more basic level, it, it is scary. That is, we do have humans that are motivated to do certain things. They can use this technology to do scary things. If there is a company that's out there using this technology to violate laws, to find ways to get around laws, to work with 
uh, computers to to completely, <laughs> you know, uh, to completely overwhelm any human controls. I mean, that's definitely a possibility. That's not science fiction. That's right. Now, like, now the interesting thing that at the end of this thought process for me so far is that the the computers are just now retracing the steps that the larger systems of so, uh, that society has already created, like the legal system, the accounting system, uh, you know, the international payment systems, all those things have some elements of corruption in them already. Yeah. And th the computers are just following in the human footsteps, but the computers, because they're foreign to us, that we recognize them as not human, allow us to recognize the shortcomings that are in the computers that we've already built into our society every darn place. Yeah. And maybe this will smarten us up and we'll say, hey, hold on, let's do something else. Yeah, yeah I've, I've always thought that whatever rules we set up, as long as they're in place for long enough, people will find ways to get around them and computers will definitely find ways to get around them. And so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, I, those are all, those are all things we should be worried about. <laughs> well, I think now that we've had an owl question and we've brought down society in all its forms, I think that's a good place for us to stop. Thank you, Dave. This was a great presentation today. I really enjoyed it.